The word Jenkins in Barbados is synonymous with madness. And I just asked the chairman, what is madness? And I think maybe we might find that out at some point or the other. But Jenkins, madness, and insanity all have the same ring in Barbados. Even if you are overheard to say to someone that you're going to Jenkins or the mental to see Dr. Bell, the assumption would be that you are suffering from a mental illness. No one would think that you came to me as a friend or you were coming to sell insurance, which people do, or to deliver a parcel, for example. However, if you went to Queen Elizabeth Hospital and you went to see, and I made up this name and I hope they don't have such a doctor at QEH, a Dr. Studwick at the QEH, you may be asked, oh, you know him too? And that would be the end of the discussion. They won't ask you if he's mad, they won't ask you if you are mad, they would just press on and be very nice and cordial about it. Uh, this legacy of being labeled has been handled down, handed down to us through the centuries. And if we go back to the earlier civilizations, uh, you would, such as Egypt and the Near East, we would note that mental illness was associated with demon possession, and the treatment was therefore in the hands of people such as priests, the venerable archdeacon, and those with magic powers. And those were what the expectations were. In the 40, 460 to 370 BC, Hippocrates postulated that human body contains four uh, humors, and these are phlegm, yellow bile, black bile, and blood. All of these were secreted by organs of the body. And these secretions were felt to be affected by the seasons and were believed to have different properties. Hippocrates further postulated that phlegm caused a form of dementia and black bile, yellow bile, manic rage, black bile, melancholia. And all of them, if they were in a unique balance with blood, that was okay. But if the balance changed, then you had the changes in people's personalities and you had the phlegmatic and you had the choleric or sanguine, as the case may be. Now, other philosophers, other persons, and I am not able to see the screen actually, so I'm hoping that I'm synchronizing well. Other Greeks such as Aristotle and Plato and the Romans, for example, Galen and others, all contributed to early theories on mental illness, but somehow nobody seemed to be particularly interested in taking responsibility for the, uh, for the treatment of persons who were insane. In those times, most persons suffering from insanity were kept at home under restraint by their families. The Middle Ages saw the development of hospitals and asylums, and the Islamic teachings particularly admonished society to take responsibility for the kindly care of the insane. Christians generally remained ambivalent, and they continued to fluctuate between rejection and tolerance, and these attitudes were strongly influenced by belief that the insane harbored demons. The insane were therefore incarcerated in what was referred to as madman towers in one, one writing, and at times were even expelled from their hometowns. They were not allowed to stay. And I have a vivid memory of an experience that I had actually when I went to do a short sojourn in an African country at one point in my life. And the patients were wandering around the parameters and even going through the gates of the particular institution that I was visiting at the time. And I said to one of the attendants, one of the doctors who was there with me, I said to them, but who gathers them back? And his answer was, we don't. If they come back, they come back. If they don't come back, they don't come back. And I was really, truly amazed because in my experience here in Barbados, I know that that would have been extremely difficult to pass by us. But they were quite contented to say, if they come back, they come back. So that was a lesson that I learned in the difference in how people cared for persons who were mentally ill. An insane person as well might have been deemed a fool. And we know that people laugh at persons who are insane and children tease them and people say that they are foolish. And it was felt in one set of teachings that they were fools 
and they lacked a mind because of God's favor. In other words, that was a blessing by God as such, and therefore they needed to be looked after. And it is documented in some other historical writings that the first Christian Western European asylum, caring exclusively for the insane, was in Valencia, Spain, and it was built in 1409. So at least we were getting to the point down in the centuries where we got to the situation where there was some place that was put up so that we could look after our mentally ill. Actually, again, I had a, a, the experience of going to Valencia in Spain and seeing a place where they said was an original psychiatric institution, and it was really scary. It was deep and dark and forbidding. The walls were six times as thick as the ones at Black Rock, and it really looked dreadfully frightening. Uh, there's another alternative theory by a Michael Stone who stated that the first asylum was built in Hamburg by uh, in Hamburg in 1373. So these are all background, these, is, these are all pieces of background information to give you an idea of how the progression of mental illness went over the ages. Up through the ages, it is again noteworthy that little was said about treatment of the individuals. The entire thrust was on incarceration. The name Bedlam in London, like Jenkins in Barbados, became synonymous with madhouse. This occurred as a result of Bethlehem Hospital in 1400 admitting the insane. So even like in Barbados, once you did admit anybody who had that stigma of insanity, then the name of the place stuck to the insane. With further development during the 16th century came many other theories speaking to the management of the insane. This gradually led to the building of asylums for the insane, as well as other institutions with directors who had the power to detain persons for indefinite periods, and who would throughout the 17th and 18th centuries lock up groups of insane persons along with others considered disreputable individuals who would offend the minds of respectable persons, such as, and these persons who were reportedly uh, dis disreputable were such as indigents, orphans, prostitutes, homosexuals, aged persons, and the chronically ill. So you took anybody that you didn't want to spend time on and to care for and bundled them into one group and locked them away along with the insane. This approach was particularly well documented in France and where the, the edict of the monarchy in that period created a new hospital administrative organization for Paris, bestowing these powers on the directors of the asylums. All of this time, the, same, the main modus of management in most European countries and England was to keep insane persons locked away at home or to allow them to walk away aimlessly. Across the borders in the US, the theory of moral treatment was being postulated by the father of American psychiatry, Benjamin Rush, 1745 to 1813. In 1844, the American Psychiatric Association was founded by 13 asylum superintendents, and these superintendents, in the view of Constance McGovern, took on the responsibility for the mentally ill. They felt that they could manage and cure the insane, and they thought that they would teach everybody else to do it as well. Well, where were we in Barbados all this time, and where were the rest of the West Indian colonies? Throughout this progression over these centuries, of course, we mirrored the countries that were responsible for our management. And as you know, we were mere colonies at that time. Colonies of England, Spain, and France mainly, and the patterns of management were destined to follow the pathways of these countries. There was, however, one huge stumbling block so we could not even progress to the point that those countries were at. As would be expected, the insane referred to as lunatics would pose problems to the persons administering those countries. The white elite plantocracy administering these countries saw such persons as a threat and a risk mainly to the persons in the society who were white and respectable. The black populations were therefore severely disadvantaged. In the slave era, 
one would imagine and believe as documented in the writings, you would believe that as were documented in the, the writings, that people generally, lost my page. The black populations being severely disadvantaged in the slavery era, one would imagine and believe as documented in the writings of Leonard Smith, University of Birmingham, from whose writings I've been most of my information being presented here tonight, persons showing the features we now associate with insanity were beaten or otherwise subjected to confinement inside the state hospital or hothouse. Caucasians during the period, on the other hand, were already privileged in our societies to be receiving provision for their mental problems. The facilities provided ensured that white persons who showed the features of insanity were removed from their homes and incarcerated if they were perceived to be dangerous or to, treat or to be a threat, threat to others. Here in Barbados, the first institution for the insane was situated in Constitution Road in close proximity to the St. Michael's Arms House. It was felt that this was sometime before 1823, but the exact date is not known. The, the Amsos, the, the asylum, as it was called at that time, and, and also referred to as a madhouse, was not anywhere that one would want to be. It had six single prison-like cells, and it also it also was very isolated from other places. No one was welcome to go to that particular institution. The term lunatic asylum was coined later on, even though the term, terminology madhouse still stuck. In 1829, a landmark year, the first colored person, a prisoner, one Samuel Dottin, who was deemed a lunatic, was admitted to the institution on Constitution Road, which until then had housed only white persons, and there was not considered to be a place for him in that particular situation. But he was too difficult, it seems, to be managed in the jail, and so they had to put him in the lunatic asylum. The place for housing most lunatics up until then was the jailhouse. Again, to reiterate what was said before, this was in keeping with what was happening in other British colonies in the West Indies. The segregation of persons with mental illness also affected persons who were British and were in the military and were here in Barbados. And the thrust was to send them back to Britain. Uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that was not adhered to. And so they were kept here on the island and were forced to mix black and white soldiers who were mentally ill. Accommodation for persons in this island with mental illness who needed to be institutionalized became really glaringly inadequate over the years. In August, 19, in August 1831, the asylum and the arms house, which we had spoken of before, was destroyed by fire. In 1844, the makeshift Constitution Road Asylum was condemned by the then, then Governor Gray and was described, and I, and I quote, so truly wretched that everyone is anxious to see something better provided. However, you know bureaucracy and the bureaucracy moves slowly as usual. And it was not until March 1846 that the Barbados Lunatic Asylum was opened. This asylum was located at the northeast side of District A Police Station, about a mile radius from Bridgetown. And it was on a road which we know as Powder Road. First, the asylum was built next to the arms house and now it was rebuilt next to the custodial prison system, District A Police Station. To me, that sent a very clear message. The stigma against mentally ill could not have been better reinforced. Some years later, to add insult to injury, the Glendary Prison was opened in close proximity. 
Between March 1846, when this facility was opened, and May, 20, 18, May 20th, 1846, all of the big number of 20 available spaces which had been provided were filled with persons from the previous institution and those who had overflowed into that institution from the jail. Leonard Smith ascertained from his research, from which I have borrowed heavily as I stated before, that even at that time as exists today, most of the inmates were from St. Michael, two from Christ Church, one from St. James, St. Thomas, and St. George. So you now know where the mad people came from. Where is Mr. Robinson? Are you from any of those parishes, sir? <laughs> the theories are urbanicity versus rural and suburban influences, culturally, socially, and economically, would be interesting to go into at this time, but I don't think that time permits me to go into a lot of detail with that. Reference can be made to this through research done in the 1980s by Graham Dan, Yui, Cave Hill, who ha had a publication, Some Observations of the Nature of Barbadian Society and its Capacity to Cater to the Needs of the Mentally Ill and Elderly, March 1986. He did quite a lot of writing in that area, some of which I don't subscribe to, but it makes interesting reading nevertheless. Planning of the Powder Road Institution was definitely not with a vision for the future. Pedro Welch, now professor, and I hope I'm correct, and principal is spelled incorrectly on my screen. I hope it isn't spelled incorrectly anywhere else. Uh, he wrote in his essay from Laissez-faire to Disinterested Benevolence, the Social and Economic Context of Mental Health Care in Barbados, 1870 to 1920, and I quote, the 1898 report also takes a look at the issue of mental health care. The poor law inspector expressed alarm that in spite of a rather fair recovery, a recovery rate and a rather high death rate, the accumulation of lunatics in this colony is strongly marked. But certain it is that during the last 25 years, the number of officially known lunatic cases has nearly trebled. So they were having a serious problem with the increasing numbers of the mentally ill as far back as 1898. The following statistics he also offered in his writings, and in 1837, 131 lunatics were in residence. 18, 1878, 142. 1883, 171. 1888, 218. 1893, 295, 1897, 333. So the numbers are, were really growing throughout the years. As would be expected, there was a gross overcrowding going on as well. As you remember, that hospital was not made to accommodate anything like 333 people. And patients were even being refused as a consequence of the overcrowding. John Chandler, an English Quaker, visited Barbados in 1847, and he made the observation that there was need for not only additional accommodation, but also special facilities for noisy, noisy and dirty patients. At this point in history, it was interesting to note that staffing was reasonably high in that there was a superintendent, three male assistants, three female assistants, and a matron, as well as a medical officer who visited twice per week. This was looked upon as both progressive and a reform process. What would we do with those people now? <laughs> By 1864, however, with continued rising numbers in the institution, the Barbados Asylum started to receive a great deal of bad press. Jamaica at this time was also receiving a lot of negative press here in the Caribbean uh, in relation to its own asylum. And I think that it was their bad press that really caused other people to look at the Barbadian situation and other islands in the Caribbean. In Barbados, it was documented that sanitation, ventilation was poor, and the rooms were being used for sleeping accommodation. So in other words, you slept where you spent your time in the day, and vice versa. The overcrowding continued to result in frequent fights, and mechanical restraint using manacles was resorted to regularly. Seclusion was also frequently used. The then medical superintendent, Dr. Francis Brown, 
whose housing had also been taken over to accommodate patients, sent out to, set out to initiate some improvements. And this was the really first sign of a different type of management, and I dare so it say, was looked at as a step towards reform as well. These advancements as documented included the use of less restraint, occupying patients by allowing them to work, introduction of exercise programs, and organized games and sea bathing. In frustration after some time, Dr. Brown approached the then governor, Governor Rawson, and out of this came some more wooden huts to accommodate a further 20 patients. And you know that all this time the patients were well into the 100 plus. In 1868, land was acquired through legislation. And after a lot of debate, this land at Codrington, St. Michael, was earmarked following all the bad press and ridicule for a new asylum. The plan was for a 200 bed asylum fashioned on the Derby Lunatic Asylum in England. This initiative suffered at the hand of the slow turning wheels of bureaucracy once more. Dr. Brown died, Dr. Hudson succeeded him, and Dr. Field replaced Dr. Hudson. Still no asylum. Conditions in the present facility did not improve, and in his articles, Institutions of the Insane in the 19th century, to which I have frequently made reference, Leonard Smith noted that Dr. Field stated, and again I quote, the present state of the asylum was dangerous to the health and lives of the unfortunate inmates. During this period, it was recorded that one patient, a female, was so badly beaten by other inmates that she subsequently died. Dr. Field further documented in his journal entries that the physical structure of the buildings continued to deteriorate and these documentations were quite graphic. Sanitation was again a big problem with outbreaks of dysentery, other diarrheal diseases, typhoid fever, all occurring within the asylum. The jail was once more housing patients with District B accommodating 30, 30, 30 female patients. Years and years elapsed and one would have to put place to blame at the door of the legislators. There were limited resources, causing some restraint and a hold was put on large public expenditure spending. However, as documented by Pedro Welch in his article, Gender Health Care, Legacies of Slavery in Healthcare Provision in Barbados over the period 1870 to 1920, and again I quote, in the Car Caribbean context, for example, it may be observed that those attitudes developed during the slave period continued to permeate the philosophies of the late post-emancipation period. Moreover, these attitudes impacted on all aspects of social life, even the area of, of health care provision. It is therefore not difficult to believe that the ruling elite class and racial attitudes were major factors for the low priority placing on health and welfare needs of the black people in this island during that period. More debate ensued, more time elapsed. The Codrington plans were abandoned. It was now 1886 and a medical doctor by the name of Charles Manning supported a proposal which had been put forward that the new asylum be located near Bridgetown and the sea. This led to the recommendation that the new asylum be sited on the former Jenkinsville plantation at Black Rock, St. Michael, near the west of Bridgetown. Finally, in 1893, the new Barbados Lunatic Asylum was opened to accommodate 434 patients. This included a facility for 20 private patients. When this journey started in June 1840, when the need for a new hospital was envisaged, it was posited that the cost of the acquisition of land and construction of that plant would have been at a cost of 2,000 pounds. At the time of the completion of Jenkins in 1893, the cost stood at the huge sum for that day of 36,415 pounds. The new plant was officially opened by the then governor, Sir James Hay, on the 5th of April, 1893, and that's just 122 years and 10 days ago. What I have to say to that is what a long, stress-filled, convoluted journey. 
There were many painful consequences. Many people died, and these were either at the hands of their fellow inmates as a result of violence or from disease. One of the biggest problems of this journey was that one could only hear of one, increasing numbers of persons becoming ill, two, increasing numbers of persons being incarcerated and dying while incarcerated, and three, the mode of treatment remaining custodial while in other areas of the world new treatment methods were being introduced. No wonder the road to Jenkins is, being, is deemed down to Jenkins. Where are we now? How do you feel having listened to this discourse on down to Jenkins? In the early 1900s, custodial care remained the order of the day. It was only in 1927 when insulin treatment was introduced that management of the mentally ill started to change. In 1942 saw the appointment of a matron and nursing personnel. Prior to that, there were only attendants. And attendants were meant to keep people in place. In 1942, new buildings were erected. The bed capacity at Jenkins was increased, increased to 700. In 1955, an open door policy was introduced, lessening the prison-like effect. Many gates and doors were removed, and free access to all wards was permitted, with the exception of one on the male side. And we know that one. It's still like that. The open door policy persists today. Although of, a, although of recent, a gate was erected at the female admission unit in Black Rock, the rationale for which they have never been able quite to understand. The open door policy was not done on a whim. The world had been introduced to chlorpromazine in 1952, a major tranquilizer which provided chemical restraint and which facilitated better management of more difficult, aggressive, impulsive, and unpredictable patients. More psychotropic drugs were introduced to the hospital during the late 1950s, many improvements followed this because people were, became much more manageable. In 1960, the hospital was approved as a training school for mental nurses. The first psychologist was appointed in 1965. In 1968, the outpatients department was established. In 1971, we moved into the district with psychiatric district nursing service having been started. An outpatient clinic was then also started at QEH. And this was in 1972, and liaison psychiatry services were also commenced at the Queen Elizabeth, on the Queen Elizabeth Hospital wards. In 1975, the first psychiatric social worker was appointed, and rehabilitation facilities were expanded during these early years of, of uh, 19, the 1970s. In 1977, some administrative changes came about with the appointment of the first hospital director, Mr. Newlands Greenwich. In 1978, saw the advent of a child guidance clinic. Psychiatric services were introduced at the Glendary Prison in 1985. By 1986, the decision was made by the government of Barbados in conjunction with the Pan American Health Organization to conduct a feasibility study to pave the way for mental health reform. This study carried out by overseas consultants and local counterparts led to the conducting of further studies in, 19, in the 1990s and early 21st century. And these led to some positive results. In 1987, mental health services were established in polyclinics. In 1990, the Roseville Halfway House was established. We already had a halfway house, but this was by the Richmond Fellowship uh, which was not totally Barbados-administered. Barbados New initiatives in substance abuse management were undertaken during this period. The thrust to continue mental health reform has resulted in a mental health policy being formulated in 2001. A mental health plan has been in the works in draft since 2004. And the Mental Health Act 1985 has been reviewed and amendments have been recommended. The Community Mental Health Service has been expanded, moving from two nurses in 1972 to 18 at present. 
there are also now three consultant psychiatrists assigned to the community. In 2008, the National Mental Health Commission was established as an advisory body to the Minister on Mental Health Issues. A lot has been done, but a lot more has to be achieved. In early 1970s, an interesting phenomenon was noted in the demographics of the psychiatric hospital. At that time, there were 15 wards in the hospital with an occupancy of 627 beds. Occupancy was usually largely was usually in the range of 91 to 93%. Most of the bed of the beds were inhabited by females. The ratio at that time was two to one female to male. Tolerance to females exhibiting any type of irrational, aggressive, or acting out behaviors was very, very low. Although women were believed to be the weaker sex, they were still expected to contain their emotions although felt to be more prone to nervous and emotional complaints. Robert Burton is documented as having written in his book on melancholy in the 19th century that tis seldom shall you see a higher servant, a poor handmaid, though ancient, ancient, that is kept hard to her work and bodily labor, a coarse country wench, trouble in this kind, but noble virgins, nice gentlewomen, such as are solitary and idle, live at ease, lead a life out of action and employment, that fare well in most great houses and jovial companions, subject to passions, such for the most part, are misaffected and prone to this disease, melancholy. That is why the prescription for women is hard work. There was also a need to get women well quickly to get back into running the household domestically and looking after her children. The above says quite a lot about the way women were perceived over time. Interestingly, the male-female ratio in the hospital at present is now approximately two to one, with males two, females one. This change since the mid-70s is directly related to substance abuse issues. As a result, the government of Barbados has gone into, into a relationship with the with the Substance Abuse Foundation, uh, where it, it has a fee-for-service relationship. And this has gone a long way to help in the management, a fee-for-service relationship, which has gone a long way to help in the management of substance abuse. The main hindrances otherwise lie in people's abil inability to see issues for what they are and address them instead of dealing with the issues as political or personal issues, and of course, we can't get away without including the prevailing stigma. All of these things have been great hindrances to the movement of mental health forward. Mental health is bigger than any of us. Over the years, we have seen mental health superseded by substance abuse, HIV AIDS, and now CNCDs. Alzheimer's disease will also overtake mental health in the near future as the burden of this disease becomes more apparent. None of these situations, however, can be effectively managed without the input of mental health. Mental health in this society remains the poor relation to physical health, and it is not seen as the major public health issue that it really is. So long as this mindset remains, which is the mindset that prevailed in the 19th century and before, the road will be long and never ending. The stigma or legacy handed down through the centuries will remain, and we shall continue on the long, winding road down to Jenkins. I thank you. Before I finish, there's a young lady who told me that she wanted to come here tonight. I'm not sure if she's in the room. But she does spend her time writing some poetry. And she has written a piece which is called The Journey. And I want to read it and share it with you. Siren blaring as we leave the QEH for Psyche. I feel apprehensive. What is in store for me? Finally, the van passes through the green gates for our assessment unit. I feel so sleepy. Won't the nurses, won't the nurses finalize the paperwork? Won't the doctor stop the questioning? 30 minutes later, I'm being hustled to female admission. Nurses waiting anxiously with my room and nightgown. 
I don't want the drama. I just want to lie down. I finally got my wish and I sprawled on the mattress. Next morning, it's bath time, grooming time, I'm back to my room. As I peep through the door, I see patients shuffling towards the day room. I see some with problems just like mine. Some patients too restless can't stay outside, so back to the rooms they have to go. Some don't take this easy and bang and pound on the door. Three days later, I get to go to the day room. As I watch the staff mingling and talking to patients, it dawned on me they really clear, care. They only have screw faces because they don't want us to have their own way, have our own way. After three weeks, three weeks, I'm called to conference. I'm told I am getting temporary leave. I'm so glad and I can hardly believe. Today is the day I will finally leave here. My journey here on the female admission has come to an end. Thank God I am finally on the men. Thank you.